Washington Journal continues. And joining us now, we have Richard Luger, former U.S. Senator, a Republican from Indiana, and now president of the Luger Center. And we're going to be talking about one of the center's uh, projects, ranking bipartisanship uh, in the Senate. Senator Luger, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Kimberly. So tell us a little bit about what this bipartisan index is. The bipartisan index that the Luger Center, along with the McCourt School at Georgetown, has formulated rates all the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. There's 1 to 100, 1 to 435, in terms of their ability uh, to co-sponsor legislation, introduce it to begin with, and get co-sponsors. Um, we have found that that is a pretty good criteria for measuring the ability of people to work together and to actually accomplish something in Congress, that is, to move programs, move legislation, move their constituents' uh, desires. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I, I would just simply mention at the outset that any of the listeners and viewers of the program can t get their own chart, their own listing of the Luger Center Bipartisan Index by going to our website, which is www.thelugercenter.org. If you do that, you can print it all out and get the whole list of the ratings of your congressman and your senator or anybody else you're interested in. Now the center, it ranks not just current uh, members of Congress, correct? Well, we had one uh, rating of just the current members that was published last fall. But uh, the one that was just published a few days ago is for the 11 Congresses. In other words, it goes into the history of the Senate. Now, we'll do another one for the House shortly. But if anybody who served uh, for a certain period of time, any time during the last 11 Congresses, is in this Senate list. There are about 230 senators. And the reason we did this is to show how the partisanship that has become very intense in the last two Congresses uh, developed. In other words, this was not always so. But uh, in any event, it's very interesting to pick up people who have served during that 20-year period of time. There are a lot of them beyond the 100 that are serving there now. Yes. So we want to bring our uh, callers into this conversation. We're talking about bipartisanship in Congress with Senator Richard Lugar. Uh, give us a call on the Democratic line, 202-748-8000. Republicans can call in at 202-748-8001. And on our independent line, you can call in 202-748-8002. Uh, Senator, tell us why you wanted to look at the issue of bipartisanship. Why focus on this issue now? Essentially because um, most political scientists and most citizens have said the Congress isn't working. Things are dead in the water. We come up to one crisis after another. Thank goodness this time we got at least a budget so we don't shut down the government. But in essence, very little legislation is passing, although the needs of the public are great, as always, both at home and abroad. In, in short, the partisanship has become so intense that it's impossible for most people to pass legislation, amendments, uh, to ratify the nomination of judges or members that want to be ambassadors or anything else. And uh, this is unsatisfying. So most polls, if you ask, do you approve of Congress? Startling, no. <laughs> uh, and do you approve of either party? No. It's very rare that either party Yes, even 40% approval most frequently is down in the 30s or the 20s. And this is not a healthy government. So what we were trying to do is to illustrate in a very critical way why you could have a situation that was different. Namely, if members at least talked to each other, had some civility, uh, occasionally introduced legislation <laughs> to, as opposed to making speeches about it, got somebody across the aisle to co-sponsor it so there was a better chance it would pass, then government begins to work again. doesn't mean anybody gives up for a moment their convictions or the convictions of their constituents. It's just that as a practical matter, Congress works only if you've got a majority of votes that pass bills. And we're trying to look at something of that variety. Then likewise, to recognize those members who have been doing this have been doing much better than others. And it's only fair that the public should know, really, 
who these people are, and especially their constituents. You spent a lot of time in the Senate. You were there from 1977 to 2013. 36 years. <laughs> you know a lot about it. Why do you think bipartisanship is a lot tougher to achieve now than it used to be? I think it's because essentially many members, in order to get re-election in their primaries, Democrat or Republican, are taking much more a look not at the Luger Center ratings of bipartisanship, but at very specific interest groups. They're really bound to particular uh, parts of their society or their constituency. And uh, so they, the scorecards there are very tough and very rigorous. Mm -hmm. Likewise, as many have pointed out, a great deal more money has come into politics. So that if you have a particular cause, uh, whether it be uh, gun control or agriculture or whatever it may be, uh, a lot of people are willing to spend a lot of money on a specific issue and run negative ads to try to terminate the career of those who do not serve that interest, not the public as a whole, but that particular interest. Um, much has been made of how gerrymandering has occurred so-called safe districts. And when, when it's a safe district, this means the primary is even more important because it's virtually impossible for the other party to win the seat in a general election. The, the, the real primary, and very few people vote in primaries. This is too bad, which means that specific interests that get out a very few people can often dominate the situation. So when it finally then comes to the, the floor of the Congress, you have people who are not interested in talking to each other. They are interested in staying alive politically and keeping track of who sent them there. So let's talk about the rankings. Who is atop of the rankings for senator? Who is the most bipartisan senator according to the new list? Well, Susan Collins of, of Maine has done very well. Now, in the latest list for the 11 Congresses, Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island uh, came out number one. Susan was number one among people who are now serving. Uh, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia on the Democratic side, has done very well, as a matter of fact. In fact, uh, my partner, Sam Nunn, from the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Act, with whom I worked for 20 years, getting all the missiles and warheads out of the former Soviet Union, comes in number five, wow. because it, it covers 22 years, and Sam served maybe 10 years of that period. So you have a lot of people from the past who really were remarkable exemplars of bipartisanship and statesmanship. Now, you came in at number 24. Yes. Was that disappointing for you? <laughs> well, it's, it shows at least of an objective survey. <laughs> the, uh, the work being done on a lot of the data was done by the McCourt School over at Georgetown. People diligently went through all of these votes for 22 years, in essence. And um, thus, I, well, I'm pleased I was no, no worse than 24th, but uh, proud we are at least in the top 10, so to speak. We are talking with <laughs> former Senator Richard Luger about bipartisanship in Congress. Let's bring our callers in on our independent line. Uh, we have Richard uh, from Chehalis, Washington. I probably pronounced that wrong, Richard. Did I? Richard, are you there? You, know, you, you were pretty close. Close okay. to the most. <laughs> Thank you. What's your question for Senator Luger? Um, well, I wanted to say it's a pleasure to get to talk to him, and it's more of a pleasure to listen to him. I wish he'd run for president. Um, but my question is, um, he mentioned the Luger Center, yes. and from what he was saying, it, it, it's, it's been on my mind. I, it's hard to get this in quick. I know you want to get people to get to the point. But... Um, when people run for Congress or Senate or for political office, they'll say what you want to hear. And when they get there, sometimes they can't do it all. And they, I think they all are good American people, no matter if they're running for the office of Senate or Congressman. They mean what, that's best for the country. They, I know they do. But when people say, well, this guy doesn't, he wants to take our guns away, they won't vote for him because another guy says he wants to strengthen guns, let you have guns. That's not a reason to vote for him. They, they could have other issues that are more important with the country than gun issue, gun control. And people are so biased towards just certain issues, they don't look at the whole picture. And there's that little thing like, well, we can keep our guns, I'm voting for him. 
but she's bad for um, illegal uh, aliens coming to the country or ISIL or not good on international issues and things. And how can you get more background on them where people could be more informed instead of just voting over what one little thing? Well, let me, let, me, let me give the senator a chance to talk to that. Do you think some of these hot-button issues make it tougher for people to really think about uh, bipartisanship? Of course uh, they do. But uh, in getting to Richard's question, this is one purpose of the bipartisan index. It is to at least give recognition and, and reward people who are thinking about a lot of things. In other words, if you are introducing legislation and you're getting uh, scored on the number of times you introduce bills, and more importantly, get somebody on the opposite side of the aisle to support you, preferably more than one person on the other side of the aisle, and you got scored for that. This means you've really got to begin working the problems of the country. It can't be just simply gun control or any other specific thing of that variety, because uh, people on the other side of the aisle are not going to support something that is perceived as extremely partisan. And on our Democratic line, we have Ben from Winchester, Virginia. Ben, you're on with former uh, Senator Richard Luger. Uh, thank you for taking my call. <clears throat> I, I'm glad to hear you mention the gerrymandering issue because I have been deeply troubled over the years watching more and more primary challengers picking out good people that are willing to work across the aisle and get something done. Um, do you think that there is that that has bled over to the Senate, number one, because um, this, this thought of the primary challenge? And then if we were to do something more on the federal level to influence or discourage more jury, more, the most excessive of the gerrymandering, do you think that that would also bleed over to the Senate and breed more bipartisanship in the Senate? I believe that the reforms really are going to have to occur at the state level. This is where the maps are drawn, and that, that's appropriate. Uh, but I, I would say that there are some states that have really tried to argue this through. California, I think, has done a good job in providing for a primary in which the top two candidates are the finalists. So that could be two Democrats or two Republicans, as opposed to a Republican or Democrat. But at least you're very likely to get some middle of the roaders. You're going to get a majority of the voters in that particular district, as opposed to the primary uh, in which you have the so-called safe district, very few people vote, and very often special interests are, are more paramount. So in our last segment, we were talking a little bit about the congressional races, and I noticed that a couple of people who are in tough uh, re-election bids also rank very high on your bipartisan yes. index, such as uh, Kelly Ayotte, a uh, Republican from New Hampshire, uh, Mark Kirk, a Republican from Illinois. Talk about that dichotomy that the more bipartisan you are, it might be tougher for you to keep your job in Congress right now. I think it is tougher because uh, essentially, as we've been discussing, most of the so-called special interests are not interested in bipartisanship. In fact, they're not interested in production of legislation or the normal workings of Congress and the check and balance of the president. They get down to very specific issues that are the most important to them. So uh, whether it's Kelly Ayotte or Mark Kirk or what have you, they have to keep looking over their shoulder to see whether constituent groups specific constituent groups in their states are ganging up on them, are prepared to run a lot of, of negative advertising, do a lot of negative research, deliberately try to sabotage their campaigns, as opposed to there being a general discussion of the foreign policy of this country, or how jobs might be produced, or how our roads might get repaired, or how education might improve for everybody. Uh, these are things that Ideally, people always say, this is what we ought to be talking about. But if you're looking over your shoulder at a very specific special interest, that's not what those folks are talking about. We are talking to former Senator Richard Luger. We want you to join the conversation. You can call on our Democratic line at 202-748-8000. Uh, on the Republican line, 202-748-8001. And independents can call in at 202-748-8002. So let's talk about your list a little bit. Who was the least bipartisan uh, on, your, on your most recent list? Well, I can't 
recall, to be truthful, and I don't want to single out. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> For, sure, no problem. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some th uh, that uh, I suspect are, are nominees for this. I think uh, in the current uh, Senate group, um, uh, Ted Cruz was very close to the bottom. Tim Scott of South Carolina was another who was uh, very close to the bottom, as I recall. Sure. And, and speaking of Ted Cruz, we have a lot of our current uh, presidential candidates have been in Congress in the yes. past, and so we have some rankings. Uh, as you mentioned, Leakin Chafee, who was a former uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination, was number one. But then the next uh, candidate, uh, you have to go all the way down to number 122, who is uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who was up until recently a candidate for uh, Repu for the Republican nomination. Yes. Why the, the, the low numbers of people who are running for president, do you think? I suppose because they too are looking over their shoulder at all the people they're going to have to raise money from. Yes. All the, the constituencies across the country that they run into in town meetings or wherever they're speaking. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I have some admiration for people running for president who are at least uh, in the top half of the list. Uh, <laughs> uh, they uh, at least uh, are heroes in my respect, and we have cited that in our commentary about the Luger Center Index, that um, this takes some courage to be in the top half. Yes, yes. Some other folks on the list, uh, Hillary Clinton, a former senator from uh, New York, is at 156. Uh, we have Marco Rubio from Florida, 170th, uh, Bernie Sanders, 217th, uh, Republican uh, Rand Paul, 222nd, and as you mentioned, Ted Cruz comes in at 224th, the Republican from Texas. Uh, let's go back to our calls. Uh, next on our independent line, we have Derek from Lakeland, Minnesota. Derek, you're on with Senator Richard Luger. Good morning, c -Span. Good morning, America. Uh, and welcome, host. I haven't seen you before, and I've been watching it for 25 years, so welcome to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Luger, you know, here's the thing. For a guy who's been around so long, respectfully, I say to you, you know, I was born in 1970, and our country is pretty much in every way has gone down the tube. Um, so you almost represent the whole amount of time. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but uh, you might be the one to blame. I don't know. But what I will say is when you start a bipart bipartisan center, you're right there telling me that there's nothing different. You know, we have, you know, it's, why isn't it a quad partisan or a tripartisan? You know, I think that the power and the greed that's happened in D.C. is so polluting. And, and uh, you know, the, the Kool-Aid you folks are drinking up there is uh, it's got to be pretty potent because I know our Senator Klobuchar, when she left, uh, her kid left. Her husband left. They moved to the East Coast. Uh, they don't take calls. Uh, you know, if you're a Democrat, maybe they'll take your call. If you're anything other, they don't take your call. They don't respond to questions. There's no accountability for you folks. In six years, you get termed uh, every time. And I just look at it and I say, you know, we need citizen statesmen that don't get wrapped up in the power. They come and they go. You know, do we need to knock your salaries down to 90000 versus 200 and some thousand? All right, Derek, let's yeah. give, let's give uh, Senator Luger a chance to respond to you. Well, let me just respond by saying that uh, I did serve 36 years too much of the time that you're describing. I've mentioned already my partner, Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, with whom I worked for the better part of two decades because we formulated legislation after visiting the former Soviet Union and the various so-called satellite countries in which we found that there were going to be possibilities to disarm them, to take back the missiles and the warheads and the chemical weapons and what have you during a time that the Soviet Union was breaking up. This was a bipartisan mission from the very beginning. It involved Ash Carter, who now Secretary of Defense, who came down from the Belfer School and had a white paper at, for a breakfast that we sponsored with Republicans and Democrats together. We were able to pass this uh, in the last gasp of the session in 1986. 
And, and I would say simply kept it alive through appropriation bills every year. This was very important in terms of the security of the country. We were in 40 years of mutually assured destruction in which a bad mistake could have destroyed an American city, including my own city of Indianapolis. When I was mayor, I had no idea we could have been annihilated uh, by weapons that I was busy destroying over there. In other words, I, I would say that there constructive work is done by members of Congress reaching across the aisle, not just once, but really working at these problems in the behalf of our country. And I believe our country is much better off than we were during 40 years of mutually assured destruction. Now, there, there still are potential problems in which terrorists might get a nuclear device and create havoc in a city in America. But this is very different than all of our cities being annihilated, all of our armed forces. That's the situation we had, and we have moved from that and moved very successfully. And up next on our Democratic line, we have Jason from Hyattsville, Maryland. Jason, you are on with former Senator Richard Luger. Good morning. Good morning, C-SPAN and Senator Luger. Good morning, Jason. Uh, I know that there are rules committees uh, there in Congress, and I wonder at times why they can't get together and just work on the rules. It seems to me so much of the problem um, with the, the impasses there are due to the short-term look at things. It seems like an objective, long, long view rewriting of rules, say targeting six or eight years out if that's what it takes, in order to get beyond who's going to be in the majority and who's going to be in the minority, uh, and write some very fair rules that would allow legislation to come to the floor, improve the efficiency of, of Congress, uh, that that would be a, um, you know, a, a good a good step towards the bipartisanship. Well, I believe that the rules uh, that we have currently in the Congress are uh, reasonable. They, they come really from our Constitution, which provides for checks and balances and provides that uh, one party should not simply trample over the other or one particular interest. So there are ways, at least, of ensuring that you get a majority and sometimes a supermajority on something that's very important. Uh, there are always are possibilities at the margins for changes there, but I believe that uh, when you look at this objectively, the checks and balances in our Constitution are reflected in the rules of the Congress. The question then is, given the fact that you're going to need, say, 60 votes for something, your ability to reach across the aisle, if you don't have 60 votes on your side one time or another, and find others who are willing to work with you. This is what, the point I'm trying to make with the Luger Center Index. It's the desire of somebody actually to talk to somebody else, and to try to persuade them that in the best interest of the country, this is something we ought to proceed on. And to do this very frequently, as a matter of fact, because we have many issues in our country that need attention. We are talking about the bipartisanship rankings by the Luger Center. We're talking here with uh, former Senator Richard Luger. Now, we, our president and vice president are both former members yes. of the Senate, so they have rankings as well. Uh, president Barack Obama, uh, former Democratic uh, senator from Illinois, ranked at 165th, uh, whereas Joe Biden, uh, former senator from Delaware, ranked 37th. That's quite a, a difference there. How do you think that um, makes them work with each other and what's the reason for that difference? Let me just say frankly that I had the great opportunity to work during the 36 years I was on the Foreign Relations Committee with uh, Joe Biden as chairman. I was some ranking member of the committee at that time. Then with John Kerry, uh, either as chairman or ranking member. And uh, we took the position, at least in terms of foreign policy, that uh, the face of the American Foreign Relations Committee of the rest of the world had best be pretty closely unanimous. If we're talking about war and peace, people in other countries are not going to be impressed by a 10 to 9 vote. So we worked very hard together on issues that were very important with the security of our country. And uh, Joe Biden uh, exemplifies that. Uh, he really was very, very helpful throughout that. Now, uh, President Barack Obama worked on the Foreign Relations Committee just uh, uh, for a, a year or two while I was still chairman, but he was very conscientious. He, he was just in the beginning of his Senate career, and so much happened after that, of course. 
But I would say, frankly, that um, after a few months, he asked, could I go with you, Dick, to, to Russia? I know you go over there every year. And I said, sure. And he, Barack Obama went with me to Russia and to Ukraine uh, and uh, we, Azerbaijan, for that matter of fact. We both sort of got religion together. We saw the dangers that our country still faced, the things that we could do. So as a result, Barack Obama said, we need to offer some legislation of our own, so-called Luger Obama Act. Uh, this, this came back to me in a strange way uh, when Barack Obama was running for president. He was challenged in the debate. What legislation did you ever produce? Oh, you know, easy, the Luger Obama Act. And so my Republican friends were not altogether pleased to hear that kind of an answer, but uh, that was the result, at least, of Barack Obama working in the Foreign Relations Committee ethos. There you are. There's a piece of uh, bipartisan legislation. Uh, next on our Republican line, we have Charles from Charlotte, North Carolina. Charles, you're on with Senator Richard Luger. Good morning, and uh, Mr. Luger, it's a pleasure to speak. To speak Thank you, Charles. You. I just got back from Washington. I spent a, a week up there, and I saw the construction cranes. And I think I counted something like 32 cranes around Washington. And I was thinking, they don't make anything, so that means that the government is a lucrative, lucrative business. Um, I see where the Clintons and the Washington Post uh, are pulling are pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars. I saw where former Congressman Gep Gephardt uh, is now lobbying for Turkey. And you see these things, and you say, well, these guys have to have a business after they get out of Congress. And I think that the real root of, of all the votes and all the partisanship, and I have one more quote, one more comment after this, but it, it comes down to just money. And then number two, we lost a statesman. You talk about statesmanship in the Congress, and I just wanted to have a quick memory on, on air for Senator Dale Bumpers of Arkansas, who I think yes. was the ultimate uh, statesman. Yes. Thank you. Well, you may be correct that a good number of members of Congress, when they leave Congress, do find employment in Washington uh, as, as lobbyists or members of corporations that are doing business, what have you. That's not true, however, for all of us. Let me just say for the record that uh, the Luger Center that uh, helped formulate with former staff members from the Foreign Relations Committee and the Agriculture Committee, I received no salary and no compensation. I'm doing this because I believe in what needs to be done in terms of bipartisanship, likewise continue to work on arms control, continue to work on food security. Uh, there are many persons like myself who are doing this kind of work in Washington or in the states or constituencies in which uh, they, they came. And uh, I admire that. So uh, I, I don't want to criticize anybody unduly, but I would just say that a good number of us who have come out of Congress have tried to capture some of the idealism that we found there, some of the ability to work together, and continue to do that. Senator Richard Luger, a former Republican senator from Indiana, now president of the Luger Center. Thank you so much. Thank you today. so much. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And that's it for today's Washington Journal. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. Have a great Monday.